very happy to uh, be presenting the work of Lisa Steele. Um, she's work. She's uh, many of you know her, but she's uh, you know on the vanguard of the uh, video art movement that started uh, uh, a little while ago, and uh, has um, really been a huge supporter of the community here uh, through VTape and through the work that she's uh, done as a teacher. Um, her collaborations with uh, uh, Kim Tomzak have been um, quite amazing. Uh, the recent uh, her, the, her recent installations are actually uh, the two other installations are at the Toronto Biennial right now. So if you have a chance to check that stuff that out, but I I thought it was would be a really interesting time to kind kind of look back at her work uh, over the last um, uh, few decades because there's there's been an I mean I feel like. Um, there's a new relevancy to some of her work um, today, and uh, exploring these these works um, on the screen is, an, is a way for us to to, to look at them and, and, and think about what they may mean uh, 30, sometimes 30 uh, or more years later. Um, so tonight we have a, uh, a series of solo soliloquies, I like to call them, that she um, made. In the, um, tomorrow night we will be uh, looking at a few pieces that she made uh, when she was working at Interval House, uh, and which was, which was a woman's shelter. And on Saturday, we're looking at uh, two pieces from the uh, collaboration that she's had with Kim Tomzak since 1983. She, uh, the early part of her work uh, was made uh, solo or with other uh, collaborators, but since 1983, she and Kim Tomzak have been working solely together, and we'll be showing uh, two works from that. So without further ado, uh, Lisa will say a few words about tonight's program, and then after that, we'll have the program and then the Q&A. So thanks. Thank you, Chris. It's a great honor to be here. Um, I wanted to just provide a little bit of context for the, the, uh, the, the works that you'll see tonight. The um, the the collaboration the the um, works for that that are performances for the camera are uh, each done completely um, individually. Uh, there's no other person in the room. Uh, there's uh, just me and the camera, and often most of them. A very personal story and birthday suit was I actually wrote this a script as such which is a list of my scars which if you've either read about or seen it so it's there's no surprises there uh, but it um, uh, it's it, I wrote the list out and then I reveal the scars and um, but personal story ballad of Dan Peoples and uh, facing south are just me and the camera uh, in various locations in my apartment at the time and um, that I think the importance of that might be to keep in mind that the um, that there's the the relationship of the performer to the camera is a very intimate one and you also had a monitor so you were watching yourself uh, while you were, uh, you could watch yourself. You could place yourself where you wanted to be, and then you you would do your performance, quote unquote. And um, it's very different than. And I went on to do more dramatic works, scripted works, works where you know I'm placing people and they're walking around and doing what I want them to do, but um, and I'm doing what I say I should do. But it's it's a very different and a much less intimate relationship um, that uh, w when you're doing performance, direct performance for the camera. So I think it's just to keep that in mind. And I'll be around afterward if you had any questions. Thank you all very much for coming. It's a great honor to be here at TIFF. And thanks to Chris for inviting me. I really had not watched that piece for a very long time, but facing south. So. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not thanking you for that. <laughs> I think it's great. It's one of my favorites. But uh, I know we, you said that. We, we 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 can get to that um, one. But um, I think. Uh, well, first, why don't you um, uh, tell us a little bit about what brought you to making videos in the first place? Yeah, I'll do that. Um, I was, um, I refer to myself as the first equity hire in the arts. I was hired because I was a woman to teach video at A Space Gallery. I had never seen a videotape or operated a video camera, but they had a, a grant that, um, and they had hired one guy. Uh, and uh, so they wanted to, they, it was equity. They wanted to have a woman um, 
for which I can thank Marion Lewis. I think she was part of that uh, that hiring uh, process for me. And uh, so I was hired, and I um, learned video uh, in you know a weekend. And um, then I was off and running and teaching people in the community how to use it. Was very very uh, primitive equipment at that t time, and um, so that's. Uh, and I was hired, I think, in maybe April or May, something like that. And then we took the month of, uh, of uh, and we were building the gallery and this stuff. And then we took the month of August off uh, in that year. And I uh, uh, took the video equipment home with me, and I began to make my own work. And uh, because I, I could see that I had been making films before that. I had made Super 8 films when I was in uh, college and university at the University of Missouri at Kansas City. And I um, uh, had some uh, professors who allowed me to make uh, films instead of write papers. So that suited me. And um, so that worked out for me. Anyway, that's how I got into it. I mean, it's funny that this replaced the act of writing a paper because I feel, especially in the first three, obviously, there's this real, um, I mean, I felt like there was this, almost this tradition, I felt this Midwestern tradition of storytelling or something like that, mm -hmm. and uh, this this idea to use this as a storytelling me medium. Do you want to? Yeah, I think that's that's true. I mean, it's, you really, it comes, um, the, the, the first three are, um, are the, the first one of those was made was Birthday Suit. Uh, the second one was Personal Story. And the third one was uh, the Ballad of Dan Peoples, so that's the order they were actually made in. But I think storytelling is certainly a part of that, um, and you can see that in the um, each one of those. I will say I, I did mention that the birthday suit had a script, which I wrote out, which allowed me to kind of go through it chronologically, which is what I had decided to do. But um, they. The other two, um, I, I took a number of attempts to make them before I, um, sorry, I'm so hunched up, it's freezing in here. Um, the, um, um, it took me a number of attempts before I was able to actually do them. I knew I wanted to tell the story of the day my mother died, but I couldn't, I would sit down, uh, turn the camera on, sit down, and I couldn't do it, and not till I put my hands in front of my face did that allow me to do it. And then it, they, I just uh, the completely unplanned. Uh, the hands drop down, and it's been commented on, and everything. But there was no planning that went into that. It was just I was going to tell this story. And um, with the Ballad of Dan Peoples, I could, I, I wanted to tell the stories of, oh, and about about personal story. Um, I was asked, I have been asked, uh, not for a long time, but I have been asked, if, oh, was that therapeutic? Did that feel better? And I said, well, no, it's just, it was not therapy. It's, it was, uh, I, you can always, you can make a piece of work and never show it. So that's what I would have done if I fa felt that it wasn't worth showing. So it was not therapy for me. It was actually, I was making my work. So, um uh, but it wasn't. It, it was interesting because I hadn't um, ever told the story, uh, or written it, or anything about it. But I, um, with the Ballad of Dan Peoples, I was, um, I had, was driving to California when uh, and passed through um, uh, Kansas City, and right outside that was where my grandfather was then, um, in a home for the aged, and he was he was passing away at that stage, but he rallied a little bit. I don't know that he knew me, but I saw him, and then I continued on my drive, and of course, because it's pre-cell phone and pre-everything, uh, it was a couple of weeks before I, I got settled in, uh, and called my brother, uh, who then told me um, that he had passed away. And I was, I was really, uh, I had lived with my grandparents as a child, so I knew my grandparents really well. And I was very sad that I had never um, uh, recorded his voice. So I thought, well, I'll tell some stories, because he had these great stories. And um, I sat down, and I sat down several times, and I could not, never, ever remember a story. I couldn't. I just couldn't remember, and I kept trying and kept trying. Finally, I, the final setup was I was holding his picture, which you see in the end, um, 
And some people say I have on his shirt. I don't. I just have on a large man's shirt. It wasn't his shirt. But um, that it has been said uh, that, that, <laughs> that I was wearing his shirt. But I obviously put something on which reminded me of him in some way. And I finally got the first line, and it was, I come up over the corner, I come up over the hill, and I seen him, I seen him stand there about half a mile down the road. And when I got that, I thought, okay, um, I think I have to sing. So I did. And that um, was how it uh, uh, evolved, shall I say. And I didn't look at it for uh, several months. Um, now I'm realizing this may be a pattern. Um, but because Kim and I didn't look at our piece for many for a year uh, after we did the hypnotism piece, but anyway, so I didn't look at it for several months, and I showed it to my brother uh, when he came to visit me in California, and um, we were both struck with, like, the f we both remembered a lot of funny stories as soon as we were talking about it, but that we were both struck with the fact that what I had remembered the most was that he had been beaten as a child. As a as a boy, and he was a very small man, um, and his you hear this repetition of his father was uh, weighed over two hundred pounds and blah blah blah, and was a sheriff and three wives and twenty two children, and you know, this larger than life character beating uh, with the, uh, a, a a young man, a child, and a young man, and this obviously made a huge impression on me because I had never been beaten or abused in any way. And that's what I remembered. That's what pulled the stories out. But I am really freezing here. I'm so sorry. Shiver. Um, it struck me watching a very personal story this time. And of course, back in, back when you originally showed it, it would never, of course, have been that large. But um, right. um, I would usually be on a monitor or some mm, sort. But, yes. but still, I, I was struck by just the... Um, putting your intimacy in public in, in s such a way. And now it seems normal, right? You know, uh, often we, I mean, this, you know, we could see uh, some kind of storytelling or um, uh, uh, confession on the internet all the time. And usually it's on a one-to-one -one kind of thing, but in a, in a larger space, um, can we grab a coat? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lauren. Yeah. Um, Thanks. You know, in a public space, I, I felt like, um, I mean, it, without without the same type of context, with a different context, I just wondered how that work um, was received or how uh, how it felt putting that world, work out into the world. Um, well, I, 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 you're right. The scale of it is quite different. And um, I have to... Thank uh, certainly Kim and everybody at, at VTape for the restoration of the work because it looks quite good now. Um, it has gone through different iterations. Um, uh, the scale, how does it look? Um, I don't know. I, I found it very difficult to watch. Mm. Um. And speaking of another film that you, another video that you found <laughs> difficult to watch, I wanted to just before we open up to questions, touch a little bit on Facing South, mm -hmm. um, which I've, I I kind of f find quite remarkable. And in, in, I mean, it's a different voice, and it's it actually it reminds me of the uh, voices uh, that maybe come out of um, what, a piece we're not showing the scientific tapes and stuff mm -hmm. that you did with Colin Campbell. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think there's this kind of I feel like th those those flowers kind of mm. it, it, grasping for the sun just is mirrored in that kind of storytelling. And I, I felt this, I, I think there's this, th this really deep kind of l levels of layers and, mm -hmm. and touch, touch and, and grasping and, and tactility to that piece. And I just wondered if you wanted to say anything about that right. piece. <laughs> no, I, I like that aspect of it too. And I, and certainly the magnifying glass, which is quite, um, you know, is, has its own humorous uh, element to it, shall I say. Um, but um, some of the language I found really odd, and I was thinking, I wonder why I said it that way. Um, so um, it, I was definitely in, in a different voice then and looking for um, a way to describe like the natural world um, in relation to um, 
and and questioning it in this kind of scientific kind of you know mini scientific uh, way, like using a magnifying glass and and describing exactly how old uh, the ceilings are and that like trying to sort of make it like as if I were doing an experiment, um, which I'm clearly not doing, um, but. Um, trying to, I think in this point, this is a midpoint in my this early work where what I was doing was trying to locate um, the way in which women's bodies um, situated themselves in relation to science, in relation to um, this observable realm of, of experimentation and and all of that kind of thing that where did where did women's bodies come into this, and how was their uh, way of, of of perception, and and perceiving, um, you know, knowledge, and also the acquisition of knowledge was very important to me at that point, and I was really trying to figure how did we come to know anything, and how do we know how do we know we're alive? How do we know we're we're, you know, talking to someone, we're not having living in a dream, you know, it was like that old question. And I was really very concerned with it and trying to kind of make stories around that. So I think that's, uh, that you're right, it is a form of storytelling. Um, are there questions from the audience? I'd love to open it up and see if anyone has any questions. And there is a microphone, so if, um, if you have... Oh, there's a... Um, maybe thanks, Lisa. It was great to see those, um, uh, and great to see them together as a as a. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, got, I mean, I have a couple questions, but one was maybe to go off the first comment that was made, not knowing your Super Eight films or something. Uh, the story to talk about story is one way to talk about it. I was just curious about sound and. You know, like all of a sudden, the, the, these images that you or the films would have been making, I'm assuming wouldn't have had like a sync soundtrack or right. maybe didn't have sound with them. And right. and then all of a sudden video, you're working with mm -hmm. images again in this kind of very lo-fi format and like Super 8, but there's all of a sudden a soundtrack and or sound elements or environmental, all this kind of stuff. And I was wondering um, if, if there's much reflection on that beyond the image um, and beyond, let's say, the narrative or storytelling, if, if that has ever come up? Well, it, it did have a, um, I mean, that's a, a really good qu uh, question, observation, because it did have a big um, effect, like as soon as you, because it, it automatically records sound, like you you can't not record sound uh, in, in, in video. So um, <coughs> it, it was, it became it became another element that was available, uh, and that was really interesting um, uh, to me, which which opened up a whole lot of because I did very at my films quote unquote um, like I I did a, um, a a short film that was that where I I did a, a super eight film of the John Gay's uh, The Beggar's Opera, and um, I did. Um, really abstract pieces also that were like experimental film. So to actually be able to work with um, uh, the, the audio, it opened up a whole new um, uh, area of it. So it, that I've, n I've never made a silent piece uh, in, uh, in video after that. Well, I have, we have, Kim and I have made a couple of the, the of pieces, our miniatures are silent and stuff, but, but not, not in this early period. I was, I took full advantage of the audio to blab on and on. Other questions? There's a question in the back, I see. Sorry. <laughs> it is cold in here. It's yeah, I was glad to hear that because I had my jacket on the whole time. Um, I, I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit, of, if you can recall, about your relation to literature at the time, because mm -hmm. seeing these now, um, birthday suit seemed to me the, the odd one out, mm -hmm. I, I guess because it was scripted. Mm -hmm. And the other ones, um, in different ways, to, as I was seeing them this time, um, I sort of processed them more as literature than I ever had before. Mm -hmm. Facing South really seems to have that, 
but uh, and it reminded me a little bit of Sylvia Plath, Juno Barnes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I thought of uh, in Dan Peoples this time. Uh, Cormac McCarthy, of course, wasn't on the scene yet, but mm -hmm. Faulkner. Mm -hmm. um, and there was something about a, a lot of um, fem feminist literature that um, was floating around at the time, I think, that was the filter that I saw things through this time, which had never occurred to me before. And so I saw it as birthday suit and then three mm -hmm. uh, pieces of literature in a way. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It's interesting. I um, I wonder. Um, I know what I was reading the, um, at the time. Um, I was reading Thomas Hardy and Faulkner. So it was interesting you you mentioned that and Virginia Woolf, and reading those. Um, uh, not not so much Sylvia Plath. I knew of her. I didn't read much poetry after I got out of school because I did uh, uh, literature. Uh, that was my degree, um, and uh, I didn't read much of that after school and uh, until I maybe later on have started to read a little bit more, but um, I was really reading people who were, um, who were telling stories from a particular place, uh, so that location was really important, and I think I mentioned that, um, like, a birthday suit and and um, uh, Facing South and A Very Personal Story were all shot in an apart, like a third floor apartment that faced south, <laughs> right, at the, um, right at the intersection of College and Augusta. And uh, it's now a medical building or something. It was torn down many years ago. Uh, but it, was, it got this great light. And so they could all be shot in the, the, the natural light, which for black and white early video was really ideal. Uh, because it needed a lot of light, and that so that location of them being located in that apartment were was really important to me. And I often would extrapolate of when what other people were talking about, what I was reading, um, you know, uh, whether it was a sheep farmer or I was reading, you know, Faulkner and you know, you talk uh, County and you know these other places. But I was really thinking about being right in the city, right in this very urban city, but with all this um, other stuff like around me, like this natural world that I was creating for Facing South or this place to tell stories uh, with the other things. So I think literature is, was, was very important to me because not until I got out of school did I start to read for, for pleasure because a, Otherwise, you're just churning through books to, to get them read. Um, but I really enjoy Thomas Mann I was reading, too. Um, I th it's interesting you mentioned like, the, the audio in Birthday Suit. I've never been so conscious of the, out mm -hmm. of the outside traffic yeah. before tonight. You when could I hear the streetcar. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, the Ballad of Dan Peoples always seemed to me like you were speaking in tongues. Mm -hmm. Um, I almost missed the content. You, you, you're so fast there. It's almost yeah. evangelical. Yeah. Um, didn't you also later do a solo performance piece called Speaking in Tongues? I, talking Tongues. Ta you're ah. right. You're right. Good memory. <laughs> um, the, um, I have, uh, Kim has heard this story, but I, I'll tell this story. Um, the, um, the Ballad of Dan Peoples was programmed by a, 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 a curator um, who was in Canada but moved back to the U.S. His name was Scott Didlake. And he um, uh, went to a museum, I think, in Mississippi, and um, like a small regional museum. And uh, so he, he programmed uh, the Ballad of Dan Peoples as part of his uh, program. And he told the best story ever where he said, because in American museums uh, and galleries, as um, it's almost always African-American uh, guards, and uh, that they, after the, sh the show had been on for about two weeks, uh, he noticed what they were doing, and they would all uh, congregate back in the room where the Ballad of Dan Peoples is playing, and and sing along with it. They had it memorized. 
and they they really loved the piece and they would sing along with it anyway. So that's my favorite story that he of ever showing anything. So so yeah, it's, it is a bit evangelical. It's certainly you if you get if you can get it, then you it's it's very it's it's a song and you can sing it. Art Metropole years ago, I think, published, they published the, the script from it. So we could do it as a public sing-along. <laughs> Just kidding. Other questions from the audience? All right, well, you know, this is not, this is the first screening. So um, tomorrow night, please join us at 9 o'clock. We're showing um, a program called Some Call It Bad Luck and uh, works that, um, um, well, there's one 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 performative work such as this, these, but um, the other ones are are more based on actually based on television in some ways. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah. almost a t television yeah. serial. So, uh, uh, a very different um, feel in many ways, but uh, really brilliant work. So, I hope you can join us at nine uh, for that program. Thanks. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you. Woo!